one of the things that the children of Israel learned when they got into the promised land was that being successful isn't always being successful. <laughs> you know what I mean? In other words, sometimes when you're blessed, you're at your worst. And when you're struggling, you're at your best. You see, God has an economy that seems to work the opposite of what most people think. Most people assume that if you've got a giant megachurch, if you've got some massive ministry, if you've got thousands of people coming to your church every Sunday, you're successful. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. Most of the people that followed the children of Israel actually just as fast as Moses wasn't there, as soon as he was busy up on the mountaintop, they quit following. <laughs> so it's really not about numbers that success is measured by, but by you. Yes, you. You are, whether or not you bear fruit, is the measure of the success of a ministry. Now, I know there are churches out there that people will say, oh, but my pastor said, all I got to do is come to church on Sunday, listen to what he has to say, you know, and I pay him in order to send out missionaries. I pay other people to go out and do that which God has said to do to them. Never mind what God told me, because after all, I'm paying for it. I'm the one who's providing the finances for those missionaries. I'm supporting my church, and we have a big, giant steeple with all the people. So I'm doing my part. After all, God needs my money and needs me in order to get the ministry going. You know, support your local county sheriff or your local radio station or your local minister or pastor but bottom line is God doesn't count you for righteousness when it comes to all these works of righteousness that you've done but really according to his mercy he saved you and the interesting thing is Jesus then after you're saved says something quite different than what most people are paying attention to you see most people they kind of get this idea that let someone else do it. I'm busy. I got other priorities. I have other things I want to do with my life. You know, I want to be a football player. You know, I want to I want to be in 10 years, I want to grow up and become, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. As a matter of fact, this ministry stuff, you know, I think it's best left to ministers. Isn't that why they're called ministers? I mean, better to give it to them to do than to have someone inexperienced like me who doesn't know what they're doing to go out and mess it up. God doesn't want me to share the gospel. God doesn't want me to be a pastor. As a matter of fact, that's kind of why I got involved in this mega church. I like going to giant churches because I can sit in the background, worship on Sunday, go to work on Monday, and hey, everything's hunky-dory. Everything's the same old story. I can keep on keeping on because I'm getting fed, you know, right? Aren't I? I'm growing and flowing and knowing Jesus, aren't I? You know, God really wants everyone to be a Paul. God really wants everyone to be a Peter. Matter of fact, God wants everyone to be like his son. Oh, no, not, not like, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, or brown hair, brown eyes, or curly hair and curly eyes. <laughs> oh, maybe that's curly fries. But anyways, God doesn't want everyone to be cookie cutters. No. God wants everyone to be like Jesus in this way. What did God tell you to do? You see, Jesus, after your salvation, said you're supposed to know God personally. You're supposed to know God intimately. You're supposed to be able to have intercourse no, not that kind, the kind of intercourse that talks, not the kind of that acts. You know, intercourse in discussing with God your life, in being able to have Him speak to you and you speak to Him, because that's what Jesus said being one was, that you would know the Father, and this is eternal life, He said, to know you and to know Him whom you have sent. So if eternal life is knowing God the Father, can I ask you a question? Do you know about God or do you know God? 
You see, the Bible also says no man has known God or no man has seen God, but we're told that Moses, you know, kind of did, you know, saw his after parts, you know, passing by in the clouds, you know, and says, hey, you know, I seen part of them, and man, I was blowing. Guess what would happen if you saw all of them? And yet, Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So, yes, you can see God and live, but not the way that you think. And that's part of the problem of what happens at church. A lot of times people think, well, you know, all these messages that, you know, my pastor gives, they're, they're good, you know, I mean, Therefore, you know, the other guy, therefore my wife or my my husband, my children, you know, to grow up inside the church, you know, to be there for 30 years, you know, or 20 years, or however many years, even like someone like the president was sitting in church and hearing the message and learning. You see, it's not a question of going to church or being in the right church or even being in it megachurch. It's not even a question of being a Sunday school teacher. I know lots of Sunday school teachers that if I ask them, do they know the Father any more than they did when they first started? No. As a matter of fact, they're probably farther away from God because they've gotten into duty over devotion. A lot of times people do that. They think it's their Christian duty to, oh, maybe read a Bible and read it through one time. Hey, I got through it. You know, I had one of those tapes. I just popped it in and, you know, I believe that I believe and that's it. Not, I know my Father. You see, Jesus came and he was able to stand up to everyone in the world at that time and say, hey, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. And the interesting thing is that he was a man at the time that he said it. He wasn't the Son of God because that was kind of like set aside temporarily for him to be fully human so that we could like-minded be like him. Interesting, isn't it? We could be like-minded like him. Because we could ask from the Father to have the Holy Spirit as he did. And Jesus said, not only would you get that, but without measure you would be given it because even greater things than I have done, you will do. Oh, really? You see, if we look around and try to count out what we think God wants us to do, then we build mega churches. We build mega steeples to hide all the peoples because they're definitely not out there building other churches, are they? They're not encouraging and exhorting each other to grow and to become more mature. Oh, sure, some of them are. I mean, I'm very impressed with a few, two, mega churches I know of. And they seem to be very much so into the development of their church. Matter of fact, I think that's kind of why God really never had millions of people following him. You know, every time that they did, he said something that really pissed them off and they didn't want to follow him no more because he always challenged them to get out of their comfort zone, to grow up into something more than what they were. In America today, you know, there are Christians that have gotten so comfortable in sitting in a megachurch, they could sit back and listen to somebody tell them that Jesus, you know, was a violent man and that, you know, he somehow advocates, you know, buying guns and protecting yourself and you should, you know, have swords and you know, weaponry and all kinds of things so that you don't have to trust in the Lord, but you can trust in your strength of arms because after all, God gave you arms and God gave you a mind and God gave you intelligence and God gave you your flesh so that you can follow the flesh, right? Since your battle is spiritual? Oh, you mean to tell me your gun doesn't work in a spiritual battle? Bummer, dude. Maybe he was talking about something else. Oh, well. I guess you're just not learning, are you? You see, sometimes what happens in a mega mindset is there's a mass media of mass affection that we all say because we're in the masses, we're one of the masses. And so with a mega, we become a mega mess or a mega mass and we have all one mind and one body, don't we? Or do we? You see, the buck that keeps getting passed off in some type of, oh, well, I did my duty, you know, I kind of came in, I did my volunteer work on Sunday, you know, and I went out on Monday, is not really the personal relationship that God said, is it? And you know it as well as I do, because Jesus said it. You know where you're at when it comes to Jesus. You know where you're at when it comes to God. You got comfortable, you know, in your job setting, and, you know, you love your wife, you know, for the most part, you're working on it because you know grace applies. And, you know, you love your kids, and you take care of them, you provide, for the most part, you know, your first set and your second set and third set. You know, you're doing your best, you know, to trust in the Lord and give the rest to God. 
But I only got one thing to know. You know, when it comes to Jesus, are you closer or are you farther away than you've ever known before? In other words, shouldn't you be pushing harder to know him better? Or are you content sitting in your tent that you've made inside of this mega steeple where you can hide with all the people? Are your mega churches really mega coffins where you can hide your faith rather than exercise it? You see, a mega church is good to practice at. Oh, you know, you get involved and you get involved in some big mega ministry. You know, they got all these opportunities. And that's good. But you practice there before God sends you out. But you are supposed to be sent out to the nations. You see, people send me all the time these pictures and they say, Oh, look at Santa Claus at Christmas. And then look at this poor starving person. You know, it's not fair. It's not right. You know, how bad we are. Then go. I did. Go. Get off your butt, quit offering and proffering excuses, and go. Because that's the problem that we have with Christianity today. Somewhere we lost the go, and we're into the get. We're into the place where we're able to sit down at a church and get what we want. We can get the message we want. We can get it on our iPhones. We can get it on our iPads. We can get it on our I, I message so that it's only inspirational for me about inspiring me to be the best me I can be. Really. I don't see any programs out there that say deny yourself. I don't see any, you know, little uh, get the latest, you know, app that says crucifixion on it, where I die. I don't see too many people giving up their rights and privileges for the sake of following Jesus Christ. You see, I see American Christianity and a lot of Christians in their mega churches say, hey, I've got the mega answer. And it is, we get to keep what we want. We don't have to give up our rights. We don't have to give up our privileges. Matter of fact, we're supposed to go out and fight for our rights. We're supposed to exercise our privileges. We're supposed to do what we want to do for the sake of the gospel and the sake of God. That sounds good in the mega church. But you see, when you're standing alone on a street corner all by yourself, when you're out there in the dark and there's no light anywhere and suddenly you know all the world's falling apart and you've lost your house your home and your car and everything else around you and all your support systems are you able to call upon the name of the Lord and have him answer you or rather do you find yourself deceived cold wet starving and hungry and destitute because you didn't trust in the Lord with all your heart you didn't lean into your own understanding and you frankly led into someone else's understanding of God you didn't in all your ways acknowledge him or let him direct your path, but you went your way because you were told that day would come when, guess what? You and the pastor would jump right into the good ship lollipop and sail into the heavens on the board the cruise liner rapture. Sorry, I don't think so. You see, there are a lot of people that are just buying tickets and trying to get into the Super Bowl. There are a lot of people that are hawking and talking and shocking people into we should do something instead of God what do you want me to do? Are you growing? You know because you know where you're at today. You know if you're taking the time and making the time to try to grow up into the stature of Jesus Christ. You know your own personal sins and the hidden sins that nobody talks about. And you yourself know what you've done and how you've done it. And you kind of like, eh, you know, I'll get to it eventually. Only you know how to change where you're at today with God's help. Because what you need to do is have a long talk alone with God. It's not about going to an elder or deacon, a pastor, a church, or somewhere else and blame it on the mega ministries, because that's not what God said. He didn't say blame anyone. He said, good, I'm glad there's mega churches. Now, Get what you can, go out and do something with it. Take what I've given you and bring forth fruit. Because you will be challenged by God to examine your demonstration of works that you've done with what he's given you. He wants some uh, money back from what you've invested. And it's not about putting it into the church. It's about your life that you've invested in others. Have you touched another soul for the salvation of their life as well as their 
family or their needs or their prosperity or in some way their knowledge of God. Have you lost that fire of knowing Jesus in a personal intimate way that you no longer want to know God the Father so that he would talk to you and open the heavens and you could walk into heaven like Enoch? Do you even believe it can be done for you? Or are you satisfied sitting in a pew? And the fact is, if we were really truthful between you and I, sitting is all you do. So look at it. You tell me. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the mega church. You have the mega ministry. You have the mega pastor. You have the best that money can buy. Are you living the life? Or are you living the life? Only you know. Because you have to make that choice before God makes the choice for you. And you know where you're at. I don't. I only know this. When everything falls apart, are you rejoicing? Do you hear God tell you, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away, blessed be the name of the Lord? Or are you hearing, it's okay, God will give you better than what you have. It's always going to get better and better and better. Got news for you. Here's the first person, maybe, that you've ever heard say something different. It's going to get worse. And God wants it to get worse so that He can grow you up into being a pillar in His temple. Because He's going to change you, either as a vessel of honor, or He's going to use you as a vessel of wrath.